हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वाचिंग वेंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा The US is staring at a default, a debt default by the government. It could happen as soon as next Thursday, the 1st of June. President Joe Biden is trying hard to strike a deal with the Republicans, but it hasn't happened yet. On Vantage tonight as we bring you the updates, we'll discuss what a US default will mean for the world. What will it mean for you and why should you care? Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in Australia and making news for a grand community event in Sydney among other things. The WHO is back to pandering to China and keeping Taiwan out of its annual health assembly. The war in Ukraine has entered Russian territory but Kiev denies any role in the attacks. India is striving hard to protect its image as a pharmacy of the world. It is cracking down on pharma companies that may be exporting substandard cough syrup. New York is sinking under the weight of its buildings. and parents the world over are feeling burnt out by raising children it's more common than you would imagine we'll discuss that the headlines first indonesia and iran sign a key trade agreement the iranian president is visiting jakarta on his first official trip there iran wants to deepen economic ties to offset western sanctions indonesia is southeast asia's biggest economy and the largest muslim majority country in the world Relief for Imran Khan the former Pakistan prime minister gets bail in 8 cases the cases relate to the violence at the Islamabad court the court complex in March this year Imran Khan's wife Bushra Bibi also granted protective bail in a corruption case TikTok strikes back the China owned video sharing app sues the US state of Montana Montana has banned TikTok the law will come into effect from 2024 TikTok claims the ban violates the right to free speech WhatsApp users can finally edit their messages but there's a catch you can do so only within 15 minutes of sending the message it's a move to keep up with competitors like Telegram and Discord WhatsApp has over 2 billion users and India is its largest market and France's short haul flight ban comes into force all flights between cities possible in less than 2 and a half hours by train are now banned the move was part of a 2021 climate law Tonight we start with what's cooking in the US. Joe Biden is struggling with a major crisis at home, arguably the biggest of his presidential stint so far. If he fails to contain it, it will hurt the whole world. It will have an impact on all of us. What are we talking about? The US debt crisis. Their government is running out of money. We've been telling you about this. They have a limit on how much money the government can borrow. It's called the debt ceiling. That limit is a little over 31 trillion dollars. It sounds like a lot of money, but the US government has spent most of it. So now they need more money to run the country, to pay for their schemes, to give salaries to their employees. Where will this money come from? The government will have to borrow, but to be able to borrow, they must increase the debt ceiling. And to increase the debt ceiling, they need the opposition party, that is the Republicans, on board. That is the rub. The Republicans won't agree. They've had multiple meetings. They keep saying they're making progress, but they haven't agreed to a deal. And time is running out. The US has one week to fix this. Some debt payments are due as early as the 1st of June. They need money for that, else they will default. In other words, the US could default as early as next Thursday. Joe Biden realizes how critical this is. He canceled his trip to Australia for this. It led to the cancellation of the Quad summit. He rushed back home to meet the Republicans, but to no avail. The US is now barreling towards a debt default. If it happens, it will be the first in American history. So a deal shouldn't even be a matter of discussion. But it has become a contested issue thanks to the divisions in American politics. Their national prestige is on the line. Their economy could sink, but Democrats and Republicans cannot resolve their differences. Yesterday, Biden met this man. His name is Kevin McCarthy, a Republican leader and the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. This is the lower house of the U.S. Congress. Republicans command a majority in this house, and this is where Biden's deal is stuck. He needs McCarthy to sell the debt deal to Republicans. 
As Biden went into the meeting, he sounded optimistic. We uh, were optimistic we may be able to make some progress because uh, uh, we both agreed that we, default's not really on the table. We've got to get something done here. He may have spoken too soon. Biden's meeting with McCarthy lasted for an hour. They called it productive, but it did not yield a deal. I thought the meeting was productive. Um, I thought it was more productive than the other meetings we had, but we still have differences. We still have differences, he says. Fundamentally, this is about how the U.S. government spends its, its money and where it spends that money. The Republicans think the Democrats are overspending. They want sweeping cuts in the budget. Spending worth $4 trillion to be slashed. That's what they want. But the Democrats refuse to do this. Their offer is to keep the spending flat, meaning the existing budget stays and they won't spend a penny more. Now it's time for the other side to move their, from their extreme positions because much of what they've already proposed is simply, uh, quite frankly, unacceptable. That's where the deadlock is. Budget cuts. Republicans want them. Democrats don't. What is the way out? Wonderful. Kevin McCarthy was asked about this. What would it take to break the deadlock? You know what his reply was? June 1, the deadline, the date on which America is expected to default. That was his answer. It seems like the Republicans want this to go down to the wire. Experts are calling this impasse outrageous. Well, to be frank, I think it's quite ridiculous that we're doing this again, right? I feel like it just shows the rest of the world how dysfunctional our government has been over the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, in my eyes, we're playing Russian roulette with the United States credit. Playing Russian roulette with U.S. credit. That does seem to be the case here. American lawmakers are behaving irresponsibly. They are flirting with default, and this could have serious repercussions. If a deal is delayed, it will lead to uncertainty. Investors may choose to pull their money. There will be a crisis of confidence. This impasse is hurting the credibility of the U.S. financial system, and it's not something you can undo overnight. The worst-case scenario will be a default. If that happens, all bets are off. It's hard to really predict the exact outcomes. It will shake up global markets and trigger a huge sell-off on Wall Street. There could be bankruptcies. The U.S. dollar could weaken, and all this will have ripple effects across the world. Prices of commodities like oil could go up. Even wheat could become more expensive, especially for countries that import these goods and pay in the U.S. dollar. People who invest in the U.S. markets could see losses. Pension accounts with investments in U.S. stocks could see their corpus decline. The impact will be significant and far-reaching. But American lawmakers can't seem to see beyond their petty politics. They're willing to risk a default only to make the other side look bad. The debt ceiling has kept Biden occupied. He was supposed to be in Papua New Guinea on Monday. Instead, he was back in Washington. Biden sent his top diplomat in his place. That's Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Blinken had two jobs in Papua New Guinea. A, make up for Biden's absence, and B, close the security agreement. We're focusing on that second one, the U.S.-Papua New Guinea security agreement. It was signed in Port Moresby on Monday. Here's how, how Blinken described it. Under this agreement, our forces will be able to board one another's vessels, share technical expertise, and ultimately, better patrol the seas together, which is vital to protecting livelihoods for generations to come. The agreement will also make it easier for PNG and U.S. forces to train together in new ways and in more places as part of our joint effort to uphold peace and security across the Indo-Pacific. We will be fully transparent. The full text of this agreement has not been released, so naturally there are questions. Students in some universities also staged protests. They say the Pacific is being militarized. To make matters worse, a leaked draft is being circulated. What does it say? Three major things. One, legal immunity for U.S. soldiers and contractors. Two, free movement for U.S. ships and airplanes. And three, no migration requirements for U.S. staff. Objectively, that's a lot. But like I said, this is a leaked draft. It's better to wait for the final copy of the agreement to emerge. So let's focus on the confirmed details in the meantime. The U.S. has promised aid worth $45 million. This will be used for security upgradation, climate action and public health. Blinken says there is nothing to worry, that this deal is just another step in a long-standing relationship. But not many in Papua New Guinea are convinced. So now their prime minister has stepped in. 
Here's what he said, and I'm quoting. It is not a military base to be set up here for war to be launched. There's a specific clause that says that this partnership is not a partnership for PNG to be used as a place for launching offensive military operations. The Prime Minister is worried about China. They are Papua New Guinea's second largest trading partner, first if you count just the merchandise. So the Prime Minister cannot afford to antagonize Beijing. He needs Chinese trade, investments and loans. What he doesn't need is a Chinese debt trap. So what does he do? Sign a security agreement with the United States. Like, like I said, we don't know what the details of the agreement are, but it will increase U.S. presence on the island, that's for sure. It will expand U.S. access to military bases. The question is, how will China respond to all of this? To be honest, they made the first move. In 2022, China signed a security deal with the Solomon Islands. The U.S. was caught off guard. The Pacific was supposed to be their backyard, yet the Chinese managed to score a deal. But then, Beijing made a rookie error. They tried to overplay their hand. How? By trying to see, sign a security pact with all Pacific islands. That attempt was promptly rejected. It also poked the U.S. into action. Biden first hosted a summit of Pacific leaders at the White House. Now he's got a security deal with Papua New Guinea. What does he want next? Ideally, total control over the Pacific. This region is important for a number of reasons. A. The sheer size. The Pacific makes up around 20% of the Earth's total area, also 28% of all exclusive economic zones. B. The location. It's right in between the US, China and Australia. If you have a base there, it could be a game changer. You can spy on ships going from Australia to the US. You can deploy assets to the South China Sea. Plus, you can control a major trading route. And that's reason number three. The resources, mainly fish. The Pacific is by far the most fertile fishing ground in the world. It exports more than 530,000 metric tons of seafood. Guess who's interested in this trade? The Chinese. Their Pacific fishing fleet has grown by 500% since 2012, 500% growth. If you control the Pacific, you control the fishing. China, with 1.4 billion people to feed, needs it. And reason number four, political and military dominance. The Pacific Islands may be tiny, but they control vast amounts of the ocean. They have 55 times more water than landmass, which means they are a front line. In a battle between Asia and North America, the Pacific will play a key role. It has happened before. During the Second World War, Japan and the U.S. fought for the Pacific. The U.S. won and went on to dominate the region. The question is, will there be a repeat? The people here certainly don't want it, including those in Papua New Guinea. PNG is the biggest Pacific island if you exclude Australia. It is home to some 9 million people. Their priority is not big power rivalries. They want jobs. They want better infrastructure. They want climate action. The Pacific Islands are the most vulnerable to climate change. If the oceans rise, they lose land. If the typhoons are supercharged, they lose houses. So the Pacific Islands want funds to tackle that. But who's willing to listen? China just wants the resources and military bases. The US just wants to drive out China. Caught in the middle are the people of the Pacific. The great power rivalry is hurting the Pacific and the island nations are looking to India for some respite. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is visiting the region and everywhere he goes, he's getting a red carpet welcome. Today, Prime Minister Modi was in Sydney. Australia is the third and final stop of this tour. He addressed a mega community event and was greeted like a rock star. A crowd of 20,000 people turned up to see him. Our next report brings you the highlights. Before the Indian Prime Minister travelled to Australia, this picture went viral. That's Prime Minister Narendra Modi dressed like a rock star performing at a music concert. Before you say fake news, allow us to confirm this image was generated by an artificial intelligence tool. It is indeed a fake. But maybe this AI tool was trying to tell us something. Because Prime Minister Modi's celebrity persona was on showcase today. The occasion was a community event. It had all the hallmarks of a rock concert. 
A crowd of 20,000 people filled the Kudos Bank Arena in Sydney. There were cultural performances. The crowds cheered for the Indian Prime Minister and the Prime Minister made his way inside the stadium with his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese. Prime Minister Albanese was the first leader to speak and he made a candid admission. To him, Prime Minister Modi's visit overshadowed a real rock star. I said to my friend the Prime Minister before, the last time I saw someone on the stage here was Bruce Springsteen and he didn't get the welcome that Prime Minister Modi has got. Prime Minister Modi is the boss. The grand event was a celebration of the India-Australia relationship. Prime Minister Albanese and his team went all out to demonstrate Australia's special relationship with India. At the reception, the two leaders revealed a plaque. Australia will rename a suburb in Sydney. A hub called Harris Park will now be known as Little India. The Indian Prime Minister reciprocated. In his address, he highlighted India's deepening ties with Australia. साथियों एक समय था जब कहा जाता था कि भारत ऑस्ट्रेलिया के संबंधों को थ्री सी डिफाइन करते हैं ऐसा पहले कहा जाता था कि कौन से थ्री सी हैं कॉमनवेल्थ क्रिकेट और करी इसके बाद कहा गया कि भारत ऑस्ट्रेलिया के संबंध थ्री डी पर आधारित है डेमोक्रेसी डायस्फोरा और दोस्ती लेकिन भारत और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के ऐतिहासिक संबंधों का विस्तार इससे कहीं ज्यादा बड़ा है और जानते हैं इन सारे संबंधों का सबसे बड़ा आधार क्या है जानते हैं जी नहीं सबसे बड़ा आधार है म्यूचुअल ट्रस्ट और म्यूचुअल रिस्पेक्ट प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी फॉलो दैट अप विद एन अनाउंसमेंट ही डिक्लेयर इंडिया इज एक्सपैंडिंग इट्स डिप्लोमैटिक टाइज विद ऑस्ट्रेलिया सून इंडिया विल ओपन अ न्यू कॉन्सुलेट इन ब्रिस्बन द न्यू कॉन्सुलेट विल केटर टू द ग्रोइंग इंडियन डायस्पोरा इन द कंट्री प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदीज एड्रेस हैड अ मैसेज फॉर द कम्युनिटी He hailed their contributions to Australia and called them a pillar of strength for the India-Australia relationship. A mutual trust or mutual respect, sirf Bharat-Australia ke diplomatic rishton se vikshit nahi hua hai. Iskli asli vajah hai. इसकी असली ताकत है आप ऑस्ट्रेलिया में रहने वाले हर एक भारतीय वैसे मैंने सुना है कि हैरिस पार्क में चटका की चाट जयपुर स्वीट्स की जलेबी उसका तो कोई जवाब ही नहीं है मेरी आप सबसे रिक्वेस्ट है आप लोग कभी मेरे मित्र पीएम एम को भी वहां जरूर ले जाइएगा द ग्रैंड रिसेप्शन हाईलाइट्स इंडिया ग्रोइंग स्टैचर इन ग्लोबल अफेयर्स टू अ फैक्ट दैट दी प्राइम मिनिस्टर अंडरलाइन इज वेल He called India's position in the world as the force of global good and a bright spot for the global economy. 
मैं ये बात फिर दोहरा रहा हूं आज दुनिया की सबसे बड़ी और सबसे युवा टैलेंट फैक्ट्री जिस देश में है वो है वो है वो है कोरोना की इस ग्लोबल पैंडेमिक में जिस देश ने दुनिया का सबसे तेज वैक्सीनेशन प्रोग्राम चलाया वो देश है वो देश है वो देश है आज जो देश दुनिया की फास्टेस्ट ग्रोइंग लार्ज इकोनॉमी है वो है वो है वो है आज जो देश दुनिया में नंबर वन स्मार्टफोन डेटा कंज्यूमर है वो देश है वो देश है वो देश है On the sidelines, Prime Minister Modi met with several celebrities and influencers. This included pop star Guy Sebastian and celebrity chef and TV host Sarah Todd. Prime Minister Modi's visit now sets the tone of future engagements with Australia. The Indian Prime Minister wants a closer relationship. He has spelled out two priorities: defence and security ties. These priorities are aimed at one adversary, China. Beijing has targeted both Canberra and New Delhi with military provocations but the threat from China doesn't define this partnership instead it's only reinforcing the need for like-minded partners to work together Old habits die hard and old politics even worse Just look at the World Health Organization their report card has been dismal failed to inform us about the pandemic failed to advise us about how to deal with it and then gave a clean chit to China in my book that is a fail but instead of learning from its mistakes the WHO is back to doing what it does best pandering to China how by refusing entry to Taiwan The annual World Health Assembly meeting is underway. Dozens of member states and observers are attending. Taiwan also asked for an invite, but once again, the WHO chief refused. Our old friend, Dr. Tedros. He's gotten re-elected as the Director General of the World Health Organization, but instead of shaking things up, he's sticking to the status quo. Hence, no Taiwan. China is celebrating the decision. Their own voice says it's a validation of the one China policy. Listen to this. The WHO has rejected Taiwan related proposals for seven consecutive years which fully evidences that the one China principle has won universal support from the international community and represents the trend of the world and is in line with people's aspiration. It also shows once again that hyping up Taiwan related issues at the WHO assembly will get nowhere and is unpopular. Some background here. Taiwan used to attend meetings of the World Health Assembly, but that changed in 2017. Elections the year before in 2016 brought President Tsai Ing-wen to office in Taiwan. She is fiercely anti-China. So starting 2017, Beijing began blocking Taiwan. What does that say? This is vindictive politics by China. It's their way of punishing Taiwanese nationals. But what's the solution? Taiwan is an island of 23 million people. It's one of the most advanced economies in Asia. Surely their contributions will be vital. Just look at the Wuhan virus outbreak. Taiwan's initial response was the gold standard. They had reported just 10 deaths by May 2021. The Omicron wave did hurt them, but that first response was unparalleled. Plus, Taiwan had close access to Chinese patients. The patient zero was a teacher from Wuhan. This gave Taiwan more insight into the virus than any other country. But the WHO did not care. Throughout the pandemic, they blocked Taiwan. They caved into Chinese pressure. Could the WHO have done something different? Well, Western countries do think so. They've been asking Dr. Tedros to personally invite Taiwan. Forget the member states. Just send an invitation yourself. but Tedros has repeatedly refused he says he doesn't have the power that all decisions must be taken by the member states 
Well then, the member states also wanted action against China. They also wanted to investigate the origins of the Wuhan virus. Why wasn't Dr. Ted Ross excited about that? His politics is risking global health. It is denying a basic human right to 23 million Taiwanese. And for what? To stay on China's good books? That was the argument during the pandemic, that China's support was necessary to fight the pandemic, to gather details about the virus. And how is that going, we ask? Three years later, China is still blocking an independent investigation. It's not like they've thrown open the labs. So the WHO's argument doesn't work anymore. One China or two China or no China, Beijing will not share details about the virus. So might as well do the right thing. As for the WHO's organizational compulsions, it's a laughable argument, really. Do you remember this picture? It shows envoys of a fictional country at a United Nations conference. You may have heard about it. Kailasa is a fake country run by fugitive godman Nityanand. Even they managed to attend a United Nations event. But Taiwan can't. Just how absurd is that? A fictional country versus a democracy of 23 million people. There is a point where human good should override politics and the pandemic was one such point. More than 6.8 million people have died from the Wuhan virus. Taiwan is one of the few countries that escaped almost unscathed. So having them on board is not a value addition. It's an absolute necessity. If not, we are setting the stage for another pandemic. Dr. Ted Ross keeps asking the world to prepare better. Maybe he should start with himself. Invite Taiwan and make our planet safer and healthier. For our next story, I want you to look at this picture. What do you see? A cloud of smoke rising up, a building in the background. It looks like an explosion or an attack. Well, that isn't any building. That's the Pentagon. It's the headquarters of the U.S. Department of Defense. But there's a catch. There wasn't any explosion at the Pentagon yesterday. What you're looking at is a fake. It was generated by artificial intelligence or AI. Some verified Twitter handles ended up posting this picture. Thanks to Elon Musk, anybody can now be verified, including this account. It says Bloomberg feed with a blue tick. Now, Bloomberg, we know, is one of the biggest media organizations in the U.S. But this account was not theirs. It belonged to some mischief maker, some random person. Many journalists and channels actually fell for this fake image. Funny, right? Well, here the other side of the story. This image caused the US stock market to dip. Standard & Poor dropped 0.26% within minutes. It only recovered once the story was busted. What do we make of this incident? The blue tick is one part of the problem. Unfortunately, Twitter is now owned by just one man, so there is little that governments or people can do. But artificial intelligence is not. It is still uncharted territory. So there is still time to put regulations in place. This Pentagon fake is just one example of how dangerous AI can be. The White House could be next, or India's Rashtrapati Bhavan, or the Parliament, or the, the International Space Station, who knows? Artificial intelligence can manipulate almost anything. And the consequence could be huge. In this case, U.S. stocks drop by a quarter of a percent. Next time, it could be worse. So what's the solution? If you don't have fancy technology, your options are limited. You can check for watermarks or even try to find out AI anomalies, like extra limbs on human beings or lack of facial features. These will tell you if an image is fake or not. But what if the AI is really advanced? In such cases, there may not be even a single anomaly. So here's what you should do. Check for other reports or pictures of the same event. Take this Pentagon example. If there was indeed a blast, there would be dozens of videos, different angles, different commentary, different sources. But that was not the case here. In this case, there was only one single photo posted everywhere, which is a classic giveaway. So keep this tip in mind next time you see a suspicious news photo. Now to the bigger problem. How to avoid such controversies in the first place. Looks like regulation is the only answer because artificial intelligence is getting more powerful every day. Let me give you an example. Take a look at this photo of the Pope in a puffer jacket. It's generated by AI, but the folks at Sony could not figure it out. This picture won an award at a global photography event. Its creator says it was a joke. He also ended up rejecting the award. 
tells you how realistic AI images are. Even experts are having a hard time picking them out. So what should big tech and governments be doing? In simple words, slow down. Right now, the technology is racing ahead of the regulation. In fact, there are barely any rules in place. So the first step is to set the guidelines because artificial intelligence is like the Wild West. It's exciting, it's impending and it's dangerous. If we do not regulate it, the next fake could be worse. Maybe AI phone calls by world leaders or AI addresses by generals or AI threats by terrorists. If you want to avoid that mess, slow down. Let the regulations catch up. Now let's talk about an actual attack, like the one happening in Russia. The Belgorod region has been under attack since yesterday. This is a region in Russia that borders Ukraine. Some fighters hit multiple villages in the area. Several drones struck Belgorod overnight. The fighting is ongoing. And who's behind this offensive? A group calling themselves the Liberty of Russia Legion has taken responsibility. We are Russians just like you. We are people just like you. We want our children to grow up in peace and be free people so they can travel, study and just be happy in a free country. But this has no place in today's Putin's Russia, rotten from corruption, lies, censorship, restrictions on freedoms, repressions. In that Russia where a person's life means less than an official's wallet. The fighters say they are Russians. They claim to have liberated a village in the Belgorod region and that they're moving towards the town of Grave Oron. Reports say there's one more group involved in the fighting. It's called the Russian Volunteer Corps. And the question is, why are Russians fighting against their own country? Apparently to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Listen to this. It's time to put an end to the Kremlin's dictatorship, thanks to all those who support us, to everyone who sends us donations and smokes where necessary. Your support is what every day reminds us of our final goal on Red Square. Be brave and don't be afraid, because we are coming home. Russia will be free. These groups say they want to bring about regime change in Moscow. The Kremlin says that's a lie, that these attackers are in fact Ukrainian saboteurs. I am now in the Graveron district. The situation here continues to be extremely tense. A sabotage reconnaissance group entered the territory. The Ministry of Defense and all law enforcement agencies are fulfilling their assigned combat tasks to protect our country. The current situation is that eight people were injured. According to information from the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Defense, there were no civilian casualties. Once again, the situation is tense and remains so. A counter-terrorist operation was declared. Many restrictions are in place. That was from yesterday. Russia declared a counter-terrorism operation. It also accused Ukraine of staging the attack on Belgorod as a diversion. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov says, and I'm quoting, we perfectly understand the purpose of such sabotage to divert attention from the Bakhmut direction to minimize the political effect of the loss of Bakhmut by the Ukrainian side. Ukraine, of course, has denied all of this. This is what an advisor to Zelensky posted yesterday. He said Ukraine has no direct involvement in the attacks on, on Belgorod or any of the attacks in the Russian territory. Kiev maintains that all such attacks in Russians, on Russian soil have been conducted by dissidents by groups like the Liberty of Russia Legion. But of course, Kiev has to say that. You see, all the weapons that Ukraine gets from its Western allies come with a clause. They can only be used for defense. They can't be used to attack Russia. But the fact is, there are boots on the ground in Russian territory. They've openly attacked multiple villages in Russia. It marks another stage in the war of attacks inside Russia. We'll have to wait and see how Moscow responds. Meanwhile, India is working to burnish its credentials as a pharmacy of the world. The pandemic established that. India sent life-saving vaccines and medicines to the whole world. But last year, there was an unfortunate turn of events. Cough syrups exported from India were linked to the deaths of children. Almost 100 children in Gambia and Uzbekistan died. India's reputation took a hit. The government swung into action. It came up with a more comprehensive regulatory mechanism. 
And the new rules will come into effect soon. All cough syrups meant for export will have to be tested and this testing will take place in government labs in India. This will serve two purposes. Regulate pharma companies and allay the fears of importing countries. Not to mention protect India's reputation as a pharmaceutical hub. Our next report has more. India's rise as a global pharmaceutical powerhouse is well known. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it stepped up to help the world with vaccines. India's pharmaceutical sector is renowned for effective medicines at competitive prices. But that reputation has recently taken a hit. It was caused by reports of deaths linked to cough syrups exported from India. Children were the victims of these faulty cough syrups. So the Indian government rushed to take action. And now it has come out with a new set of rules. From June 1st, all cough syrup exports will need to be tested. That too at government labs. Seven of these labs have been marked for testing. A cough syrup sample will have to be sent to them for checks. Once they clear the tests, they will get a certificate of analysis. Only then can these cough syrups be exported. It's a thorough process to ensure there's no compromise on quality because lives are at stake. Last October, news of faulty cough syrups emerged from the Gambia. It's a West African country of about 2.7 million people. Reports said that some cough syrups had led to the death of about 70 children. The WHO issued an alert. WHO has today issued a medical product alert for four contaminated medicines identified in the Gambia that have been potentially linked with acute kidney injuries and 66 deaths among children. The WHO began an investigation. It turned out all of the cough syrups had a common link. Four medicines are cough and cold syrups produced by Maiden Pharmaceuticals Limited in India. WHO is conducting further investigation with the company and regulatory authorities in India. The investigations failed to establish a clear link between the deaths and the Indian cough syrups. But then came reports from Uzbekistan. In December, 18 Uzbek children died after taking an Indian cough syrup. It was made by Marion Biotech. It's a pharmaceutical company based in the city of Noida in northern India. In both the Gambia and Uzbekistan, the children had died due to kidney failure. The Uzbek investigation revealed that the cause was toxins in the cough syrup. The toxins are diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. The same toxins were found in Indian cough syrup exports this year as well. This time in the Pacific Island nations of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. India had to act fast. You see, India has a $41 billion pharmaceutical industry. It's the world's largest supplier of genetic medicines. About a third of all genetic drugs are from India. These go across the world, from the Gambia to the US, from the Maldives to Micronesia. Indian drugs are everywhere. So India has to ensure the very best quality. The Indian government stepped up. In March, the Drugs Controller General of India raided about 76 pharmaceutical companies. 18 pharma licenses were cancelled after the raids. And now comes this mandatory testing requirement. It's a welcome step. Hopefully, it can help save lives. Venice and New York. The former is a city in Italy, the latter in the US, quite far apart, but they share more than their love for pizza. They now share a sinking feeling because New York City, just like Venice, is sinking due to the weight of its skyscrapers. It sinks about two to four millimeters a year. Doesn't sound very much, right? Four millimeters is three twentieths of an inch. This descent is so slow, it sounds almost amusing. But experts say it's the very opposite of funny. New York's sinking is a serious problem. And it's an issue shared by several other cities in the world. But why is it such a threat? And what can be done about it? Here's a report. This is New York City, the Big Apple. It's America's most densely populated city, with over 8.4 million people. But do you know what else this city is home to? It's skyscrapers. New York is world famous for its buildings and it has over a million of them. Can you guess how much they collectively weigh? 
A strange question to ask, but stay with us. They weigh 762 billion kgs. That's a lot, right? New York City would agree. Because it's getting buried under the burden of its own weight. Correction, it's sinking due to this weight. And we aren't saying this, a study is. New research has been published. It says that New York City is literally sinking. Some areas are subsiding much faster than others. Like Queens, Brooklyn and Coney Island. Areas like Manhattan are sinking at a slower pace. Because their skyscrapers are anchored in bedrock and not soil. So different parts of the city are being impacted differently. But one thing is common. All of New York City should be worried. Because it's sinking between 2 to 4 millimeters a year. This doesn't sound like much, but this gradual descent is a big threat. It makes the city more prone to natural disasters, and the downward force of buildings, coupled with rising water levels, create a big flood risk in the city. And this risk is only increasing, thanks to global warming. Plus, climate change is also strengthening hurricanes, which means storms could be up to four times more frequent by the end of this century and they could invite deadly floods. So New York City is not only sinking, but also unwittingly welcoming worse calamities. As you may have heard, misery loves company, and New York has plenty in this case. Cities across the world face a similar future, including Venice in Italy, Mumbai in India, Jakarta in Indonesia, Bangkok in Thailand, London in the UK, Lagos in Nigeria, and Dhaka in Bangladesh. Out of all these cities, only two are aggressively looking for solutions. The first one is Venice, which is sinking at the same rate as New York. But after years of dithering, the tourist hotspot has built seawalls, costing Italy over $5 billion. They're helping as of now, but experts are doubtful about their long-term benefits. So climate change still seems to be winning the long race. The other city is Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. It too is sinking, and at a much faster pace than New York. But Indonesia has a solution in mind, quite opposite to that of Venice. It has called Venice's seawalls a duct tape solution. So instead, it's building a new capital city from scratch. Like the child who's about to lose a game, and decides it's better to start a new one rather than persist with a losing cause. So, where does all this leave New York? Will it build another Big Apple on higher and drier land? Experts say unlikely, simply because this sinking is not an emergency for the city, not yet anyway. But it's surely headed in that direction, and soon they could be in the sink or swim territory, quite literally. New York is often known as the city that never sleeps, and now it has another reason to stay awake. For our last story tonight, let's talk about parenting. They say having children is like living in a frat house. No one sleeps, everything is broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. But jokes aside, the struggle is real. Because while parenthood is rewarding, it can also be exhausting. Raising a child is hard. Many say the hardest job in the world. According to a recent survey, two-thirds of parents say it's harder than they'd expected. And this is not in their heads. Research says parenting is more demanding than it used to be. Today, parents spend more time and money on their children than previous generations. They feel more pressure to be hands-on. And this can feel like a juggling contest, a balancing act between taking care of children and managing your own well-being. And guess which of the two takes a hit? It's usually the parents' energy and well-being. And the result is this, parental burnout. No, this is not a buzzword or a Western concept or an excuse to do less. Parental burnout is real. It affects tens of millions of parents across the world. In fact, it's probably existed for centuries. Only the term is new. Think about it. The term parenting itself is relatively new. Fun fact, rather a sad fact, parenting wasn't recognized as a word in the dictionary until the 1950s. It only became widely used in the 1970s, but because of the shift, Child rearing came to be seen as a task, a concept that pushes people to do more, to be more successful as parents. And this leads to pressure and then to burnout in some cases. So what is parental burnout? A lot like 
workplace burnout, except here parents face physical, emotional and mental exhaustion. And this is thanks to the seemingly endless demands of caring for one's children. It's a syndrome that results from chronic par parenting stress. It involves fatigue, irritability, body aches and changes in sleeping patterns or appetite. If you show these signs, ask yourself these questions. Do you experience constant exhaustion, physical or emotional? Do you feel like you aren't doing enough? Do you feel overwhelmed with the role of being a parent and do you feel emotionally disconnected? If you do, you may be suffering from parental burnout and there is no shame in it. There are many out there like you. Parental burnout is a global phenomenon experienced across communities and cultures. It's highest in countries like Poland, Belgium and the US. About 8% of all parents in these countries are burnt out. But like I said, the research is new and these studies don't really cover some Asian countries like India and many African countries. But they do say that parental burnout is vast. Research shows that 60% parents do not routinely relax. 50% say they don't have enough time to do the things they want. And 40% say their tiredness stops them from being the parent they want to be. So what should they do? Experts say take a break. Make time for yourself. It will improve your mental and physical health. It will also help your children and your family. Start by telling yourself it's okay to take a breath, to be kind to yourself, to prioritize yourself. Parenthood can be the most special and rewarding of experiences. Children are like the gifts that keep on giving. But to make the most of it, parents need to set priorities and seek help if they're burnt out. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with India. The Natu Natu fever has reached the G20 summit, the meeting happening in Kashmir. Actor Ram Charan made delegates dance to the song. In England, water buffaloes took a dip in a new private swimming pool in Essex. The owners of the pool have sought compensation. They say the animals have ruined their pool worth over $80,000. And in Guatemala, some cliff divers took their skill and love for adventure to a new height. And finally, what makes this day, the 23rd of May, significant? We are taking you back in history on this day in 1915. Italy declared war on Austria and Hungary. And with that, Rome entered the world war on the side of the original allies, Britain, France, Russia. Initially, when the war broke out in 1914, Italy chose to be neutral in the conflict. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.